We're going to talk about ultrasound phantoms. This is called the vertical registration, and this is responsible for determining the exact size and location of each pin at certain depths. This does not evaluate depth resolution. Don't confuse this with axial resolution or any other name listed in LARD. These include longitudinal, axial, range, radial, and depth. And also, don't confuse this with space resolution because you'll get a question that'll say, which of the following is the ability to discern two closely spaced reflectors as individual reflectors, which is called spatial resolution. And spatial resolution has nothing to do with this horizontal or vertical registration. These are only determining the pin's echoes in the correct location and size. For your boards, you'll need to know that vertical registration is the same as range accuracy, but has nothing to do with range specificity, range resolution, or range ambiguity. The depth resolution is determined by these areas in orange. The orange areas are the depth resolution. A lot of people will get that confused with the board. This has nothing to do with axial resolution because you can see how easily you would get that confused because the pins are going straight down. They look like they're equally separated. The pins circled in blue represent the horizontal registration and these will accurately determine the size and location of each pin from side to side and the horizontal registration must accurately determine the size and location of each pin at this depth, and then must accurately determine the size and location of the pins at this depth. Don't confuse horizontal registration with lateral resolution or any name that resembles LATA. This means lateral, angular, transverse, and azimuthal. In summary, the sole responsibility of the vertical and horizontal registration is to accurately represent each pin's size and location at certain depths. Both vertical and horizontal registration is the ability to place echoes in the correct location. Now, which one will determine or which one calibrates the dynamic range? The areas circled in yellow with the little circles inside that range from hypoechoic to hyperechoic, isoechoic would be right here. And isoechoic means that the structure has the same texture or brightness as the rest of the tissue, or it will resemble the surrounding tissue. This calibrates your dynamic range, which means it also calibrates your contrast resolution and your grayscale. You're going to look for those names on your boards, either dynamic range, contrast, or grayscale. So what is the dead zone? So the dead zone, what it does is it tests the ability of the reflector to accurately image within a first centimeter of the sound beam. In this phantom, the area circled in red represents the dead zone. And in this area, this will test the ability of reflectors to be accurately imaged within the first centimeter as the sound wave exits the face of the transducer. What are we left with? We've covered the dead zone, the contrast dynamic range or grayscale, the horizontal and vertical calibration, but which ones will actually calibrate the axial and lateral resolution? Because we're only down to one more color. These will both evaluate your axial and lateral resolution. It all depends on which way the beam is going. If the beam is coming from top to bottom, then it's going to be evaluating your axial resolution because you can see that there's two little dots here with the little spaces in between. This is determining whether or not they can see one or two dots. Right here, you can kind of see there might be two dots, but it's hard to see the space in between just because the axial resolution or the SPL is too large for the space. But you can see the space here, here, and here because the SPL is shorter than the distance between these two dots, as well as these dots and these dots. If the beam is coming from the side, then it's evaluating lateral resolution. This will determine the ability to accurately identify two reflectors perpendicular to the sound beam. As the beam is coming from the top, this will determine the ability to accurately identify two reflectors that are parallel to the ultrasound beam. What is the minimum distance that can be detected between two pins in this image? This diagram here on the left represents the calibrated axial resolution as it should be. You can see the spaces in between each pin have a number. But on this side, you only have three dots and then one long line. The distance between each purple dot is labeled here. So right here is six millimeters. This is five, four, three, two, one. What is the minimum distance that can be detected with this line? or with this side. And once I tell you the answer, you're going to go, oh yeah, that's so easy. What you do is you compare this side to this side. And if you count down the dots, this goes to one, two, three. 
one, two, three before they all combine, the actual resolution is poor right here. That means the minimum distance of this diagram is four millimeters because when you compare this diagram to this diagram, it looks like this long line starts about the three millimeter mark. Then you have your four millimeter space, five millimeter space, and your six millimeter space. The minimum detected distance in this diagram is four millimeters. And in this diagram, the minimum distance is six millimeters. There's different types of phantoms. And this first one that we're gonna talk about is the tissue mimicking phantom. And just like the name says, it is the closest that we can create to actual tissue. What you need to write in your notes is that this will evaluate not only the dead zone, but axial and lateral resolution, the vertical and horizontal distance accuracy, and evaluates the echogenicity of hollow and solid cysts. On your test, you could get a question very similar to this. Which circled area is responsible for depth calibration? Blue, green, orange, or red? Green. Or you could get a question like this. What does the circled green area calibrate? And it could be, you could have depth resolution, depth ambiguity, depth, or depth sensitivity. C is the correct answer. Depth resolution mm -hmm. is orange. Let's say they ask in your test, when using a tissue mimicking phantom, the depth at which echoes are no longer detected is an indicator of what? And the answer to this question will be sensitivity. Because sensitivity is the ability of the system to detect echoes, these include weak echoes, and display them uniformly with the same brightness on the monitor. This is a tissue mimicking phantom. The circled area represents cysts, which is the contrast or the dynamic range. Then we have a slice thickness phantom. Slice thickness artifacts, when we use ultrasound, this is what we see, correct? We just have our mm -hmm. sector in a 2D imaging plane. We're just looking at an image in a 2D imaging plane, but actually the ultrasound is transmitting a beam that looks like this. This is kind of like a 3D look to this. This is the same beam, but just in a different view. If you're looking up at it, it has a lot more volume to the sector, but we only see this. This is a slice. When you break it down even more, there's actual slices that come out like this. This is mm -hmm. an angle, and this is kind of like looking up at it at a certain angle. The spaces aren't really this far apart, but this kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. If these slices aren't razor thin, then you're going to start getting slice thickness artifacts. And for your boards, you need to remember partial volume artifacts. Partial volume artifacts is the same as slice thickness artifacts. And the way you prevent these artifacts is by using a 1.5 dimension transducer. And what happens is you'll get an object that might be, let's say right here, this is where you're imaging. This is where you're living right now. Like I said, this is what your beam looks like. Not like this, like this. And if you're looking right here, but there's a bright echogenic structure right here, that bright echogenic structure is gonna show up in your beam that you're, let's say you're looking right here, the bright structure is gonna show up right here. When we get to this, Right here, this is a slice thickness artifact. This isn't in this plane. Just by looking at this image right here, what other resolution looks like might be degraded? The axial and lateral resolution is degraded right here. You can't tell the distance between the two pins right here. Now looking at this right here, which color on this image represents just the depth? The blue calibrates the depth. Which one calibrates the dead zone? The white. Which one has the best axial resolution? The yellow. Which one is calibrating the dynamic range? Pink. Here's what they'll probably do is they'll either ask you questions like I was doing just now, or they'll have like the phantoms shown here labeled A, B, C, D, and they'll say, which area represents the dead zone? You would select A. Which one represents the near field? B. Which one represents the Fraunhofer zone? D is in dog? Correct. They'll either ask you on your test which letter represents the dead zone or whatever, or they'll say click on the area that represents the dead zone. Then we have the Doppler Phantom, 
which is also called the string phantom. It's going to determine how accurate your pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler is, as well as your color flow Doppler. It calibrates the ability to test your pulse wave at certain depths, which is like your depth mm -hmm. resolution, your depth specificity, so on and so forth. And they could show you a certain phantom, and then your job is to identify which one it is. If you see an image with this bright echogenic line going all the way down that's kind of like separated in certain spots almost equally, that's a slice thickness phantom, same as this one. The dynamic range will evaluate your grayscale. The way you adjust your dynamic range is with your compression. When you turn up your compression, you're actually turning it counterclockwise. And oh. you're making your numbers go down, mm -hmm. which means when you turn up your compression, you're turning your knob counterclockwise and you're making the number of your compression go down, thus making less shades of gray and more black and white, like this image right here, which means you have a narrow dynamic range, a low dynamic range, and a high contrast. If you want to get your image to look like this, if you want your image to look like this, you have to turn your knob clockwise, which will lower your compression, making more shades of gray. This has a wider dynamic range or high dynamic range with a low contrast and a binary code or word. On your test, how do you make the image, the label this A and B, how do you make image A look like image B? And what you'll do is you will decrease your compression to make this image look like this image. When you decrease your compression, you're actually adding more grays, making the dynamic range more wide, lowering the contrast, increasing your dynamic range, as well as your grayscale, because you have more choices. This is the easiest way to remember it. When something's compressed, if you compress your hands together, how much air is between your hands? Not much air, right? When we compress all the grays together, how much grays are going to be in that area? Not very many, right? When you compress your grayscale, you're just going to have black and white. So this is very compressed, and this one is decompressed. You have lots of grays.